Okay, uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, it's great to be invited to talk. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm doing the practice-based PhD part-time here at Sunderland. Um, but I've been doing that for the past five years part-time. Uh, up until then, I've worked across varied disciplines in glass. Um, from craft to art to product design, really. Um, so what I wanted to do was talk about the different aspects of my practice in glass up to the research I'm doing now at the University of Sunderland. Um, my work's been really varied and has changed quite a lot in that time. Um, so this is where my studio is based in 36 Lime Street in Newcastle. Um, it's shared with, uh, it's an old flax mill and it's shared by a community of about 40 different artists, musicians, printmakers, designers. So it's a great uh, place to be part of. This is my studio. I moved here in 2012 after 10 years uh, as a tenant artist at the National Glass Centre. And um, I share my studio with an artist called Zoe Garner, who you might have seen around the building. Uh, she's often in uh, Wayside Glass with Brian and Norman. She's a flame worker. So we've been there two years and we're building up our equipment. We've got a couple of kilns, a sand blaster, um, and yeah, a small lathe. So yeah, previous to that, I was at the NGC for 10 years. But my work has evolved a lot through uh, that period. Uh, I did my degree at Manchester Metropolitan University, uh, specialising, well, it was a degree in three-dimensional design. And uh, I think I love kind of melting things because I loved uh, hot glass and I loved metal. So I specialised in those in, in my final year. Um, and I liked making functional work but also with an element of uh, the organic, kind of the fluidity of the material I was interested in. Uh, so these are some of the, of the pieces I made for my final show. Uh, the one on the left is a cast pewter bases with blown stem wine glass. So I graduated, I graduated with the first in 2000 and I was invited to do New Designers, which is a graduate show in London. Um, a great show to do actually. and. Um, while I was there, I was approached by the uh, course leader of Wolverhampton University, uh, Glass and Ceramics. And he invited me to apply for a scholarship, which was an industrial scholarship for a master's degree to Edinburgh Crystal. Uh, so I applied and uh, I got the scholarship. So I did about three months uh, developing ideas in Wolverhampton. And then a few months later, I was up in Edinburgh at the factory full time, uh, developing my prototypes. So the, the Master's Scholarship was a 15 month uh, MA. And the idea behind it was to develop a range of giftware and stemware that targeted a new audience for Cook Crystal. This is what Edinburgh Crystal was known for. Um, so it's diamond wheel cut, polished uh, stemware and giftware quite old-fashioned and traditional. So the factory uh, brought in scholarship student, a scholarship student each year to, um, to work with the team there to develop a, a new, pr new prototypes for production. So this is uh, a couple of the glass blowers in the factory. And it was amazing working with these guys because they had 30 or 40 years worth of uh, glass blowing production experience. Um, and I got to work with them. And these were the guys in the cutting shop, Horvis and George. I don't know why he was called Horvis. Cool name. <laughs> so I learned a lot from these guys, not just how to cut glass, but also how to communicate my own ideas to someone else to make the work, which I was used to making it myself. So that was something I had, a skill I had to learn really, was communicating verbally my ideas, but also on paper. So some of the final pieces from my uh, master's exhibition. I was particularly interested in using the um, the cutting, the wheel cutting, as surface texture, um, or to change the form as opposed to pattern or decoration uh, in the traditional sense. So these uh, these are the pieces on the right, uh, wine glasses with injection press stems. I was interested in using asymmetry because a lot of uh, production glassware is made in moulds and uh, very symmetrical. So they're uh, asymmetric 
uh, stems. And the top uh, left piece is free blown, which they didn't do a lot of in the factory either. The bottom ones, the ball forms, are actually uh, side lever pressed. These are some more of my uh, Emir pieces. And the ones on the left, uh, because the factory used a lot of turn molds, uh, I was quite interested in uh, using <coughs> asymmetry. So I developed uh, a mold insert that rotated on ball bearings that moved with the glass inside the mold so that uh, you could actually have an uh, asymmetric base on the pieces, which was then cut and polished. Final degree sh uh, MA show in the visitor centre at Edinburgh Crystal. <coughs> so another thing I learned at Edinburgh Crystal was uh, how to technical draw, which has been re really useful since then in my practice. This is the design team. Um, it, after I finished my MA, I was taken on in-house as an in-house designer and uh, some of you might recognize Jessamie Kelly who's second from the right. She uh, studied here at Sunderland and recently did a PhD and uh, it's Jess who I went into business with later on. So it was, it was really great seeing my designs in the shops. I enjoyed uh, working for Edinburgh Crystal. Um, I also learned how to take criticism of my work uh, from the sales team constructive or not, so you learn not to be too precious about your designs and ha have a bit of distance from them in a way. Um, so the imaging range here was uh, a, a, a range I worked on when, d when I was in-house as a designer. A lot of designs never make production because of the cost of moulds, metal moulds being produced. Um, also at this time Edinburgh Crystal was sourcing a lot of products from abroad, so Slovakia, Poland, uh, manufacturer was moving over there. So uh, it tended to be a case of uh, safe options, uh, designing products, designing patterns on existing blanks or existing wine glasses, things like that, because uh, making molds and minimum orders were just prohibitive for new products. So this is the Edinburgh Crystal design office. Not the most creative environment to be in, really. I, whilst it was, uh, it was an. In I did really enjoy my time at Edinburgh Crystal. Uh, there wasn't that much option to think creatively uh, when I was working there full time as a designer, and I didn't get a chance to make and get my hands on the glass. So I really want to make my own work again. And I'd heard that the National Glass Centre was running a scheme to support new creative businesses in glass and. Uh, so I decided I would take the plunge and become self-employed. So in 2003, I, I took a studio space, a little tiny space here at the, well, over at the National Glass Centre. And uh, I decided I would develop some work uh, to sell through galleries. And uh, luckily, I'd, I'd negotiated some freelance design work with Edinburgh Crystal, uh, which saw me th through the first six months of my business uh, while I wasn't selling any work. So it kept me afloat financially. This was a project, a freelance project that I did with one of the ex-managers from Edinburgh Crystal. Um, she was doing some work with the Scottish Malt Whiskey Society and uh, this was a limited run of tasting and nosing glasses for whiskey. So we got to taste and nose a fair bit of whiskey which was quite nice. <laughs> and these were what were going to be my Joanne Mitchell designer range for Edinburgh Crystal which I, was, I went across to Slovakia and worked over there to develop prototypes for my range of production uh, pieces. But unfortunately, just before these were due to come out, uh, Edinburgh Crystal went into administration after a factory fire and closed, so they never hit the shops, unfortunately. So freelance design and design for manufacturers is kind of hard to come by these days because manufacturing has moved uh, to the east, really. Um, but I have done a little bit of work for, this is a company in China called Qingdao T&T. Um, and they went into production. This was a couple of years ago. You can't always uh, have that much control of quality when you're working at that distance. But so it can be a bit of a challenge. But I had a good relationship with this company until 
the managers changed uh, when I brought this design, uh, when this design came out, and unfortunately I didn't get any royalties for this one. So I suppose that's a hazard of working at, at long distance. But back to 2003, uh, so my early practice, I wanted to, this work was kind of an extension of my master's degree work, um, working with cutting, wheel cutting to um, work with balance of form and, and explore the material of glass. So these were wheel cut and core works. So I was interested in uh, surface texture, contrasting the material qualities um, and working with the interior and ex uh, inter interior of the glass and the um, exterior surface. And I began to get galleries and cell work. So this is called Breeze, and it's really about just finding harmony and balance of form. Hello. Sorry. Um, so how did you go back to making the work? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, yeah, I started to make um, glass again. But what I found was that um, to make enough money, um, I wasn't actually a good enough glass blower. I couldn't make enough in a day to actually make these pieces cheap enough to sell. So I teamed up with uh, a glass blower called Colin Brown, who worked in the Glass Centre studio team. And um, unfortunately, he no longer makes glass, but uh, we worked together. And so he would, I designed a form that I would make with him that we could make a lot of in a day. And then I would take them away and change the form, co work them, and cut them afterwards. This was my first uh, trade show, British Craft Trade Fair in Harrogate. And I joined a group called Cohesion Glass Network. And um, we the good thing about cohesion was that it allowed you to show uh, as a group and do shows that you wouldn't necessarily be able to sh uh, do on your own or afford to do on your own. So they kind of allowed me to find galleries and start to sell my work. So all these pieces are actually based on one shape that was then changed in, uh, through cutting and co-working. This piece is called Dancer, and that was in the British Glass Biennale in 2004. And I also became interested in other techniques such as casting. So I found it really um, helpful to, well, it was really important for me to join networks and associations to work to kind of meet other people and make connections because self-employment can be quite isolating. Um, so I joined a network called Design and Made, and uh, in about 2008, I got the chance to take part in a design exchange to St Etienne. And there was four of us designer makers uh, from the north, from Newcastle, who uh, were paired up with four designers from uh, from France, St Etienne, and um, we got the chance to respond to each other's work and make a new uh, couple of uh, commissions as a result of that. So. That was a year-long uh, design exchange, which was really interesting. Um, I was partnered with a designer called Sandra Ville, and it was her work was really interesting. The work she did for a living was uh, very much industrial design. She designed uh, window shutters and, and uh, street furniture, but her personal work was very conceptual. Um, so. And I, I found it quite interesting that most of the designer makers in uh, France work that way. And they saw, well, most of the creative practice, people's creative practice was industrial design and their own, their personal work was much more kind of personal and conceptual. And they found, uh, well, it was considered a designing, designer maker a way of life, a little bit elitist to them, which I thought was quite interesting. So we had a final exhibition in the Sage and also in uh, St Etienne City, City of De Design. And on the right is uh, my response to one of my responses to Sandra's pieces, and that's her response to mine. Uh, this was in 2009. So I really enjoy collaborating with other people. Um, this is. Uh, Yoshi Herzeg, a fine art photographer who, with a, some funding from Creativity Works at the university, came across and worked with myself and Zoe Garner to um, really explore ideas around uh, photography and print on glass. 
and um, and just to develop a dialogue between what in his work and our and the way we worked. This is a collaborative piece between myself and Zoe Garner with flame working and uh, water jet cutting. So for me, it's really important to make links with other people. Uh, the, we had some visitors from Taiwan to our studio in the Usburn a few weeks ago, actually, and um, did some activities with them and talked about our work. And hopefully we can continue that connection in the future and go across to Taiwan. This is the Affordable Art Fair in Battersea in London. Um, I, got I did this show for about six or seven years running with uh, cohesion glass network and uh, it was a great show to do and also I wanted to put this in because being part of a network gave us the opportunity to do shows that we couldn't do individually so and uh, actually this is a gallery show a gallery art fair and they don't usually let groups in but because of the quality of our work uh, we were actually able to show our work there So being part of uh, Cohesion Glass Network also gave me the opportunity to travel to Washington DC in 2009. And I visited Washington Glass School and uh, DC Glass Works and met uh, Michael Janis and Tim Tate, who have since come over on a Fulbright uh, scholarship and continued that relationship with Sunderland, which is great. So on the left is the work that I exhibited in Artomatic, which was the exhibition that we did over there. And basically a group of artists took over a, a huge um, office block, which hadn't yet been opened and exhibited their art in it over the summer and thousands of people came to visit. So it was an amazing opportunity. Um, and the piece, the pieces on the right there, I th I'd started to work in glass fusing, um, which was a collaboration with Jessamy, who had met at Edinburgh Crystal. Um, we set up Duo in 2006 and we were approached by an agent who had worked with Jessamy previously and he wanted to um, work with people who made fused glass art for that he would then sell through his galleries. He was an agent for Oriforce and Costa Border. So uh, we decided to work together. We got a bit of funding from the Arts Council to set up the business and uh, the agent took 20% of our sales. So the pieces we made were made with fused uh, and slumped float glass. And they were basically uh, wall panels for domestic interiors for people's homes. This Horizon series was uh, made using float glass with uh, compatible fritz to create the colour. And these sold really well, I think people um, liked having something in the home that they could live with and relate to. We had a lot of commissions for specific cityscapes. The top left is a commission we got from S City of Sunderland Council. They had a friendship agreement with Harbin in China and so that piece uh, was shipped over to a museum in Harbin um, as a representation of Wayside. This is a, uh, another piece of Holy Island. Working as a uh, kind of co-directors of a company is very different from being self-employed. And you each bring something to the business. And Jess was really good at networking and promotion. And we started to get corporate work uh, coming in and commissions. This was a commission for Newcastle Building Society. And the idea was to make, the brief was to make links between uh, Iceland and the Northeast. So we went and cast the beach in Whitley Bay to get the, the tidal patterns from the beach and then used the ice kind of texture in the piece. And this was in 2008, we won the uh, Pearson's Prize for Retail and Interior. Uh, this was a commission for uh, Newcastle, um, Newcroft Centre, a health centre in Newcastle. So we, uh, we got this toughened at Peter Lee Glass and uh, worked with a uh, subcontractor to make the, the uh, outer, the metal part of the construction. So um, with 
duo, I was still also making my own work and uh, we were working from uh, my studio so we, we moved to another studio as duo got uh, more established in at Creative Cohesion in Sunderland City Centre. This was another cast of a beach uh, for a North Berwick gallery, the Estes to go and cast, cast their beach. Um, it looks really sunny there, but it's actually about minus one. <laughs> um, so I worked uh, with Duo for about six years until 2012. Uh, I was working about three days a week as Duo, uh, one day a week writing for Cohesion Glass Network magazine, and then another couple of days um, on my own work, I was working about a 60 hour week and it, it kind of got a bit too much and by this point Jessamy was pregnant with a little boy and commuting down from Edinburgh so we got to the point where it, we thought um, it's probably about time to quit, the business had kind of run its course um, but I do still make this kind of work, fused glass work for commissions and this is a wall panel that I made for a school up in Northumberland I also make quite a lot of corporate ward work uh, it can be quite good because it tends to be a lot of awards at once and then it can finance your other projects. These ones are hot poured ones I made with the hot shop, uh, with the studio team in the glass centre. These are uh, cast, ground and polished and wheel cut, heavy. Um, I'm also on Twitter now so I tend to be able to see who gets the awards because the companies will put their ceremonies on Twitter, which is nice. So I, I quite enjoy making these things um, because you can experiment with technique and the material. These are spectrum glass. They're fused. And I, I enjoy experimenting with the optical qualities of glass, um, interior and exterior, and opaque and transparent. So this was uh, an early experiment that I did in about 2006, I think, into trapping air. I, it was a, a furnace billet that I cut up and wheel cut and then fused back together to see what would happen. And uh, this was kind of the, an early experiment that led to my research, really. So I became interested in how you could use wheel cutting uh, to make indent, indents and sandwich uh, these indents in the glass and heat them up to trap air. And so I thought there's something really exciting in this technique, you know, I've got to be able to find a way to harness it, to <coughs> use it for creative expression as, a, as opposed to just as pattern, or surface pattern. Um, so this is a, a first kind of test that I made with text and layering float glass to trap air. So it's sandblasted text uh, between layers of float. And the reason I used float glass was because it had potential for scaling up. It was cheap to buy and also because of its clarity. Because it's made for windows, uh, the potential was huge for scaling it up. So I researched other artists who use air in their work and uh, there wasn't really anyone who used it for the, to the level of complexity that I, I wanted, apart from Mark Petrovich, whose work is the bottom, middle bottom there. And he uses air in a, in a kind of level of narrative and complexity and uh, content that I, I loved and thought was really interesting. So I wanted to take this technique and use it in the kiln. This is the original innovation of air trap. Um, it's, these are pieces by Orofors Glassworks in Sweden from the 1930s. Uh, a guy, a sculptor called Edwin Ostrom, uh, who designed these. And they're usually almost all heavy walled vessel forms but they had a, a kind of complexity and a narrative that was a real innovation at the time. And continue, people continue to make, to use this technique today. It hasn't really changed. This was the first uh, sandblasted air trap piece that I attempted. Uh, and it was based on uh, my own personal diaries, uh, sandblasted with a stencil onto the surface of the glass. And I was interested in using this kind of immaterial tool of air to explore memory and thought and to represent that. But I didn't really want people to read it. Um, 
<laughs> and I thought about this, and it, I thought about the, the exposure of emotions and the exposure of the self that is an artwork, but also I quite like the idea that whilst the, uh, the, the words were there, the meaning was hidden because of the distortion from the air. So um, this, to my research, uh, my primary tool is the kiln and my secondary tool is the water jet. Water jet gave me the opportunity to scale up uh, massively using float glass. So the idea, instead of sandblasting uh, into the surface of the glass and layering over it like you would in the hot shop, you can cut right through the sheet of glass and sandwich it and heat it up in the kiln and, that, and so the air bubble will form. So the complexity that you can get from the water jet and the detail is uh, beyond anything you can get in any other way. So I saw it a bit like an upscale sandblaster. It's quite a techie process. Luckily my AutoCAD from uh, my technical drawing came in here because that is what you use to program the water jet. So I had a bit of a head start there. So I, ca I came across this image and I liked the idea of it being a kind of uh, a man with the insides exposed, which is kind of how I felt when I was making the diary piece. And I also found this one, which, was, which I used uh, in my testing. So that's that figure programmed into the water jet. Some of the tests, pretty quick. Um, I did find that the technique was a lot harder to resolve than I expected. And it took me about four years of testing to get it right. So in the meantime, I really wanted to work on my own ideas, uh, personal kind of uh, thinking. And I wanted to make pieces that had a bit more personal depth uh, to me. So this is called Retrospect. And the, I don't know if you can see there actually, but the diary text is engraved onto the shadow. So I was exploring the use of the figure. And I wanted to uh, um, think about the marks made on the inside of a person. Um, uh, as the journey through life. So it's about personal identity as the subject of the work. This is about boundaries and control of information. An exploring metaphor, really. This is printed. Uh, the diary information is printed uh, on the inside of the glass and then water jet cut. So it's imprinted on the internal figure. So these pieces were really about personal identity and self-reflection and exploring, that, uh, exploring the figure uh, as part of that. Um, I found that through the kind of technical development and through the making, sometimes that sparks <coughs> ideas. And uh, I was cutting out this sheet of glass to keep the void, which would be sandwiched in between two layers. And uh, all these tiny little figures ended up floating in the water jet bed. You can see one of them just up there that on the edge. And I had the urge to kind of collect them and save them and keep them. And uh, I thought it was a, a really interest, interesting connection how we kind of personify something because of its form. So because it had a human form, I kind of saw that as, as human and, and gave it character and wanted to save it. And I also quite like the perceived preciousness of it and the fragility of the glass that related to the figure. So these are some of the tests. At the same time as developing ideas, I was trying to resolve the technical problems of working with uh, float glass because it's not actually made for uh, fusing. It's quite difficult to fuse. And uh, I had a lot of technical issues with the process so about, at one point, about one in 10 tests were actually successful, like the one on the bottom. I wanted to fuse the work cleanly like this. Um, and I thought, this must be possible. This guy's done it. But actually, then I realized this was laminated, which is glued, uh, and then core work. So but I like a challenge. So I just kept uh, trying and trying and working with the variables and testing and testing. And eventually, I actually. Uh, made it work, but people 
I couldn't find any research in, into it, and no one else in the world seemed to be fusing flow glass like this. And people said, why don't you just use bullseye or spectrum? Use a glass that's made for fusing. But this was the difference. So the piece on the right was a flow glass piece that worked, and the piece on the left was bullseye. So I really wanted that clarity. But I got there. <laughs> and I began to think about the figure as representation of self um, and this idea of air as immaterial. So because, and because of the air bubble, the figure's kind of implied. It's, it's a kind of crude shape. But people did see it as a figure, and I found that kind of interesting. So how people perceived it began to emerge as a theme. And I put this in because this was a show in uh, New York, New York Affordable Art Fair. And I got this show as a result of doing the art fairs with Cohesion Glass Network in London. A gallery saw my work and uh, asked if they could take it to New York. But you can see the, the scale of the pieces are quite small, and I wanted to scale them up. And I thought if you can layer, if you can create cutouts and sandwich the uh, the cutouts, well, I could make three-dimensional cutouts and, and layer those to make a three-dimensional form. So this was my first attempt at a 3D figure. And people's responses to this figure were really interesting because it's kind of ambiguous. Some people saw it as uh, male, some female, some saw it as an alien or some kind of robot, something like that. So that was something, a kind of a theme that I liked you know, do, do, do people feel empathy to the figure or not? Do they relate to it? This piece is, this is a piece called Host, and it's a multiple layered uh, air entrapment. And with this one, I expanded the air bubbles because I wanted to make the figure quite ambiguous. Um, I was interested in how individuality can be kind of lost in the masses. Um, <coughs> so it's exploring identity. And I, I was interested in the idea of how we kind of, we're, we're going through life um, observing other people and they're going through their life observing us. And that kind of interested me. And I like the idea of glass as a lens. Uh, so it's a kind of a pool shaped lens. This is how it was made. I had to develop a mold to uh, to cut, well, fuse it into to support the sides. So I worked with Bob, Robert Winter, the ceramics technician, and he threw me this mold to uh, cast it into in the kiln. So this is a mock-up for a piece that I'm working on at the moment called Legion. And uh, it's on this, this same theme of empathy, um, how we exist kind of in a moment with other people. I want to give it a sense of anticipation and impermanence and use the, the air as immaterial but also present. Um, this is work in progress at the moment. I'm going to make it in clear glass rather than blue. I'm actually a quad, which I think is uh, where my interest in individuality and multiples comes from. <laughs> Perhaps gives me a bit of a, a different uh, identification with people. So I began to think a bit more about identification and how we, we have this propensity to dehumanize or see uh, human qualities in objects at the same time. So this was a kind of deconstructed version of the figure called entity. People still perceive this as a figure, which was interesting. Um, so this is the 3D man, and I became interested in humanness. What is humanness, and how do we perceive it? What identity does the viewer see when they see this figure? And what does it reflect about me and their own identities? I'm also interested in the fact that because it's glass, it's a window, and I want to make it big so that when you're looking at that figure, somebody else might be looking at it from the other side. So you're observing them, and they're observing you. So 
because I'm interested in exploring the self, I wanted to make a self-portrait in air. And uh, I was talking to the visiting artist, Joseph Hillier, who was here last week, about what I wanted to do and how I was going to kind of find a, a scan of myself, scan my own head. And he went, well, I've got a portable 3D scanner in my bag. Do you want to scan your head? So <laughs> I'm like, all right then. So he scanned my head, and this was the result opened up in Rhino. So what I'm going to do is break that down into layers, cut them on the water jet, stack them together, and then fuse it in the kiln and see what happens. This is work in progress. Um, reverting back really to the diary idea and the piece that I couldn't resolve before I'd resolved the technical problems. I also wanted to take this back into the hot shop to see uh, what we could make uh, using roll up, the roll-up technique. So this is what uh, I've been working with Jim Maskery to uh, roll up the air entrapment. And this is what we made. This is with Spectrum, actually, which I found was too seedy, too many little bubbles. So we did some in float glass as well. So that's kind of a work in progress. So I'm coming to the end now, but I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about another aspect of my practice. There's a couple of familiar faces in there that you might recognize. Um, so, <laughs> so I've done a little bit of teaching over the last couple of years, and uh, this is Cleveland College of Art. I also took part in a project called Journeys with the National Glass Center. Um, which was funded by the Gillian Dickinson Trust to bring in people into um, the glass centre who wouldn't necessarily engage with glass or a cultural venue. Uh, so I had groups from a school with an artistic specialism, a group of uh, young people who weren't in education or training, and also some special needs children. And um, I worked with four, I think, four different groups from those schools and. Uh, it was really challenging, but really interesting, and we ended up making a final piece. I also worked with Lily Daniels. I don't know if she's here. She was my assistant, and she was great. Um, so it was a kind of learning curve for me, because I'd only ever taught adults, so teaching children was kind of different. But I think helping someone to create their own work, I really enjoy, and it's kind of finding what their creativity brings out. And we worked with them to, to lots of different glassmaking techniques that we to make uh, different things with. These were two of the final pieces from that project. And the two guys there were from uh, Harrington Burn YMCA, the uh, NEAT group. And they came to the exhibition, which was also part of the Magdalena opening and Jim Maskery's exhibition opening, and were pretty impressed with the whole thing, I think. And very ha I was so happy they came. It was great. Um, so yeah, just to finish off, this is Pilchuk. I had the opportunity to uh, go across and work with KK Crids as her teaching assistant in the summer. And I met KK uh, a couple of years ago at the CGS conference here at the Glass Centre and kept in touch with her. And she invited me to apply to be her uh, teaching assistant at Pilchuk. And I went with support from the City of Sun uh, Sunderland University Futures Fund, which I'm really grateful for. This is KK's work. She works with mosaic, uh, reverse painting on glass, and makes these huge boats. This is about this size. Beautiful pieces. And she's a really generous uh, person as well. I went and stayed with her in her home, and she welcomed me and, and taught me a lot. This was our class at Pilchuk. It's an amazing place. If you get the chance to go, you should go. It's like a big glass camp in a forest. And I got to meet this guy who was the founder of Pilchuk, who you glass people should all know, Dale Jehuli. So working with another artist whose work's very different from my own, um, it, was, it was really a refreshing experience for me. And it helped me to evaluate my own practice and kind of rethink the way I work. And I also met so many inspirational people there. So we're hoping to collaborate more in the future, too. So this is my working title, Air Contouring, a new technique for air entrapment formation and bubble controlling kiln glass and its creative possibilities. And uh, I kind of prefer the term doctorate in bubbles, but <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Um, keep in touch. I'm on Twitter. Um, 
And if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. end of my fourth year before I, I was making it work. Four years of testing, part time, so yeah. I'm just I'm in my sixth year now, so I've got five months left <laughs> to make all my work. <laughs> now I'm getting that. Uh, anyone else? Can I just say, uh, I, I love the breadth of experience that you have and you know all the different places that you've worked and what you picked up from each one. Um, and the pleasure that you take in it all, the excitement of it, and I, I really feel that comes over very, very strongly. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah. And for the New York show, you mentioned you wanted to try a, a bubble man in 3D. I, I didn't really get what you were talking about. Oh, by 3D, I meant actually layering the the cutouts to make a three-dimensional bubble as opposed to a flat bubble, which oh, was the original. one pane of glass. Yeah, so rather than one, several, yeah. So with the head, the self-portrait idea is to use thin sheets of glass and layer those up with the, the contours of the head and fuse them so you get a much more detailed figure. Why is it only the male figure? Well, is it male though? Is it? Yeah. It's pretty much. Uh, it's from a male figure, male. but it's kind of ambiguous, and I kind of like the idea that it was ambiguous, so that what you see is what you project onto it. But also, I mean, it is a male figure, and I, I didn't want to use the female form because I felt that obviously I'm female, and using the female form has connotations that I think me, that say something. Uh, it's quite like you said, a loaded form, and I think the male form is less so, which is why I, I chose to start with the male form and then make it ambiguous. Will you yeah. use the same temperature that you've developed for your, um, your traps of fill people for your big one of your head? I don't know yet. Um, I think I'll start with that temperature and then, and then kind of work with it because different the different scales need different temperatures and yeah so working that out has been what's taken the time you know how to uh, control that kiln program to create the best uh, air entrapment for specific pieces yeah sorry th i'm from ceramics so it's a technical -ish question that mm -hmm. everyone else might know but when you did the work in the hot shop where you trapped mm -hmm. the air how yep. does that work? Do you work, do you put a That's a kiln formed slab, so it's pre-fused, um, just to start the bubble off, because if you heat it up too high, then the bubble's just going to want to go round. Um, so it's pre-fused to quite a low temperature, and then picked, rolled up uh, in the hot shop by Jim, and then made into a vessel. Thank you. So is the, um, does the air expand? Is that why you get that distortion? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, so it's to do with the temperature that you take it to. Um, and controlling that expansion is pretty much what's taken all the research time. Right. Yeah. It's quite incredible, really. Because it expands and contracts as well. So yeah. Yeah, you, can, you can play with the temperature in the kiln to control that, uh, depending on whether you want a kind of chunky one or skinny one. <laughs> I mean, I've actually seen your work, and I hadn't thought if you see a reflection within the bubble, and I was just suddenly imagining of your, with the piece of your head, how it would feel or look like for you see. when you were looking back, or do I don't know that you do see well, a reflection. I don't know yet. I'm interested. Yeah, I'm interested to see um, how much it'll look like me. Um, and how, how distorted it'll be or not. Um, yeah, that's something to find out. And also, yeah, the reflective qualities, I don't know. But I like the idea of the glass being both a reflection and a window so that you can see through it and you, you get all these reflections in it as well. Hmm. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.